Well, Sunday had come and gone, and the, the triumph of seeing Jesus as the sought Messiah was starting to drain a little bit. The, the people had cheered him as he rode into Jerusalem on the back of that donkey, and, and those shouts, Jesus is Messiah and King, as he dismounted that donkey and looked upon the gates of Jerusalem. Well, the coronation was over, and the, the leaders of the law and religion, they were, they were now embracing for that reality. And that reality was, what are we going to do about this guy? Because this Jesus of Nazareth is gaining such great notoriety. We need to stop him because he is thwarting our efforts of the establishment. So that's really the question to begin with this morning. This is the Monday of that last week of Jesus' life. Why were the religious leaders, why were they? so upset with Jesus at this point. Last week we talked about how Jesus had done the unthinkable. He had, he had come in and he had overturned the tables of the money changers. I talked to you a little bit about how the doves, which were the doves used for sacrifice, had to be unblemished. And the only way to have a bona fide, certified, unblemished dove was to purchase it within the temple walls itself at extraordinary rates. We also learned that the temple uh, would not accept the regular currency that was man-made because certainly it had graven images on it. And the only way that they would accept that currency was to convert the currency of the pilgrim who was buying the dove for uh, the sacrifice to convert that to temple currency. And that could have cost as much as three weeks worth of wages. And Jesus, remember, was upset about that. And that was the whole emphasis of Palm Sunday. He rides in there declaring that he is the Messiah and he weeps as we talked about because he knew that the people would not see him for who he was and that the destruction of Jerusalem was soon to come. Well, even with that triumphant entry into Jerusalem, um, Jesus had in no way given Caiaphas or, or even the Roman leaders uh, any indication that he was going to revolt. And, and again, last week, we, we looked at how he came in as the Prince of Peace. He did not come in by sword. In fact, he, he prophesied that by the sword, Jerusalem would fall. So he hailed himself as a, as a Prince of Peace, and that in itself was cause for alarm with the followers. We also saw that, uh, that they decided that they would not arrest Jesus at that time, even though he had so many followers. Because think about it for a second. At this time of Passover, probably a million pilgrims were, were insurging upon the land of Jerusalem at that particular time to observe the holy season of Passover. And at that very moment, it would have been extraordinarily impossible for the Roman garrisons to overpower by number the number of pilgrims. So Caiaphas and the priests, along with the Roman garrisons, knew that they needed to be very careful in how they handled Jesus at that, this particular point. They had to find some other way than manhandling him, and they wanted to think of a creative way. And here's how they did it. And that's how money began, by questions. They did it by asking Jesus questions. In fact, there were three specific groups that, on that Monday that, that confronted Jesus with questions. And the purpose of those questions was to try to trip him up, to create a snare, to uh, place him in a way of which he would not only violate the laws of Judaism, but more importantly, he would violate the, raw, the laws of Rome, who was occupying Jerusalem at the time. The first group that was there was a group that... Um, uh, was kind of founded by the priests, and uh, they sent out spies, as the scripture says. And they followed Jesus all around into the territories, looking for those precise words where he would make the proclamation that he was the Son of God. Because upon saying those words that I am the Son of God, not only would he commit blasphemy in the eyes of Judaism, but at that point in time then, the high priest could take Jesus uh, over to the garrison into the presence of Pontius Pilate, and he could say that this man claims to be God. God, and Caiaphas would, uh, would uh, crudely say, and we know, Roman governor, there is only one God, and that is Tiberius Caesar. And that right there, Rome would have said, was insurrection on Jesus' part, and they would have put him to death at that particular place. So here's what Luke says as we get to this point of trying to understand with these questions from this first group, the priests. One day, as he was teaching the people in the temple courts and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the teachers of the law together with the elders came up to him. And listen to these words. By what authority are you doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? 
And I love what the message translation says. The message kind of breaks it down into terminology that we could understand today. Here's what they were saying. Jesus, show us your credentials. Who authorized you to speak like this? Now, I can just uh, hear that conversation, you know. Jesus, what seminary did you go to? Jesus, what prestigious college uh, did you attend to, to understand all the facets of theology and philosophy and, and of the 613 laws of Judaism? Who taught you that? And Jesus, what authority? You don't come from the priestly line. You are a carpenter of Nazareth. And as they were asking these questions, we understand that the whole purpose of that was that the priests and the spies were trying to get Jesus to confess that he was the Son of God, and they were trying to irritate him to the point to push every button that there was about him, to have him proclaim outwardly that, yes, I am the Son of God, but you know what? He didn't say that. Because he was waiting for that specific time to make his presence known. The second group that's uh, challenging Jesus that day were the Pharisees and the Herodians. And the Pharisees, we, we learn an awful lot about them, and they are the teachers. They are the persons that are uh, higher in the establishment of what Judaism represented. Herodians, we don't really know a whole lot about them. Likely some sort of a religious sect. And, and this group, um, uh, they come to Jesus, and the question that they ask goes like this. And here's what Luke says in 20, 21 and 22. Teacher... Addressing Jesus. And I want you to listen to the tone of this because it's almost condescending. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right, and, and what you do not show partiality, but, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Do you, do you hear kind of the, the nonsense? We know that you're this, and we know that you're that, and you only teach the truth. But now here's where it comes Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar? That's the zinger. That's the question. That's the piece where they're trying to undermine Jesus. And this question actually creates a paradox for Jesus. Think about it. Go back and think about why were the Jewish people looking for the Messiah at that particular time. Two reasons. One was to liberate them from the heavy taxation that Rome had placed upon them to keep the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And secondly, to remove the Romans from their area because Rome had now occupied the areas of Judaism. And they had established their own selves and allowed the Jews to do their own thing. But it was still a land that was occupied by a foreigner. And the role of the Messiah, as they thought in this time, was to liberate them from those two points. So, so the question, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not, you can see where this is going. The Pharisees are somewhat devilish in their question. Because the question can only be answered in one of two ways, or so they think. The first question is that Jesus could say, no, don't pay taxes. And that would get the people all excited and they would rally up and they would say, it's time to revolt. And right then and there, the Pharisees and the chief priests could go right over to, to Pontius Pilate and say, he is defying paying taxes to Rome. That's a, an act of insurrection. You must have him killed. Or Jesus could say, yeah, pay the taxes. Now, if he said pay the taxes, that would immediately play into the Pharisee's hand because that would discredit Jesus as being the Messiah as they understood. So we see a couple of things here. And, and Jesus, and he knows exactly what they're doing, and here's what he says. He says, show me a denarius. And he says, whose portrait and inscription are on it? Caesar's, they replied. And he said to them, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Now, you're going to see a... a, 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 a a picture or a portrait of a denarius at that particular time. And what you'll see here is you'll see the image of Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius came after Augustus. Caesar Augustus was the one that we read about at the birth of Jesus. And, and Tiberius is now Caesar. And, and the interesting thing here is um, the question becomes then, if Jesus says, give to Caesar those coins, give him the money, and why, he says, because look at whose image is on that. Now, what we need to look at in close examination of that coin comes with this inscription. And the inscription says, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. Do you see where this is going? Now, on that coin, it not only has a picture of the Roman emperor, but it calls him a son of divinity. And therefore, what is called into question as Jesus is looking at this is, is Jesus is now taking 
the Pharisees back to their uh, very own knowledge of the Torah. He takes them back to the creation story. And he talks to them and he says, we were all created out of the image of God. In Latin, it's the imago Dei. And, and what we see with that is it's the image of God. And, and that's what the creation story says to us, that, that that's what separates us from every other piece of creation is that we have this special connection with God, that we are created in God's image, and therefore we have a soul, we have a, a character, we have a connection that places us into the image of the Almighty himself. Paul says in Romans 12:1, he says, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, and that is your spiritual act of worship. So Paul gets it right here, and, and what Paul is saying is, it is a reasonable act then, when Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, the money, and give to God what is God's, Paul reflects this and says that we give to God what is God's when we give ourselves and our bodies and all that we are as spiritual acts of worship. And when we worship God and when we become the, the hands and the feet and the heart of God in the world, that we are giving ourselves and that's the significance of, of what it is, that, that we give ourselves as a sacrifice uh, to, the, to the Lord. So the third group that comes are the Sadducees. So we've had the priests, we've had the Pharisees, and now we have the Sadducees. The Sadducees, think about um, uh, blue bloods in our society. These would be the, the persons of wealth, the persons of high education. They were of the priestly um, a family, so to speak, and their specific role was to overtake or to uh, uh, to oversee the entire operations of the temple. The priests were the ones who did the sacrifices, but the Sadducees oversaw the entire temple um, uh, operations. But but here was the thing: the Sadducees looked at the the ways of Judaism, the theology of Judaism, and the Sadducees said there are bits and pieces of this that we can buy into, but a lot of what you teach in Judaism is well below our lofty and our ability to think. And here's one thing that they didn't believe in. They did not believe in eternal life. They didn't believe in eternal life, which means to a Sadducee, they didn't believe in resurrection. So guess what question then the Sadducees are going to ask Jesus to try to trip him up, to try to ensnare him, to try to embarrass him in front of all these people who were there. They're gonna ask an afterlife question, aren't they? They're gonna ask a, a question that deals with resurrection. And here's what Luke says to us, uh, still in chapter 20, verses 27 to 33. And listen to, these example, to this example. Some of the Sadducees who say that there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, that the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first one married uh, the woman, and, and, and he died, and they were childless. The second then married, and then the third married her, all the way through the seventh, and each one of them, the same thing. They died with no male children. And finally, the woman died too. Now, here's the zinger. Here's the question. At the resurrection, whose wife will she be? since there were seven married to her? That's a great question. I mean, do you see the implications of this? This is a question of resurrection, but I find it kind of interesting that the one group that doesn't believe in afterlife, doesn't believe in resurrection, is coming to Jesus now and posing this question about resurrection. And I love it, the fact that, that because they ask this question, we see the nature of Jesus come out. In a nutshell, here's the question again. If a woman remarries and her husband dies, and in this case, seven, seven husbands, and they don't have any children together, and they all get to heaven, specifically, which one of the husbands would own the woman as his wife? You know, the Bible is clear in modern times today. It says that we're not supposed to have multiple spouses. We are a monogamous society and, and certainly not a, a polygamous society. And, and I really think that it speaks well in for men because, you know, it says that it wouldn't be good for men to have multiple wives, especially at the same time. Why? Because the Bible says that a man cannot serve two masters. But anyway... So Jesus' reply here comes in a way of saying that, that if you don't believe in the resurrection, then, then let me answer your question to maybe 
school you a little bit. And he comes out of Luke 20, 34 through 38. Jesus has replied, the people of this age marry and they're given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage and they can no longer die for they will be like the angels. They are God's children and since they are children of the resurrection, but in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise. For he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For to him all are alive. Now think about this for a second. Jesus is schooling the educationally elite. And he's saying to them, the one thing that you do buy into in the laws of Judaism is you believe in the Torah. And he points him especially back to this question where, where Moses is before the burning bush as God is talking to him about liberating the people from the bondage of Egypt. And he says, he reminds him that God says that I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob, and I am living, or they are living, and I am not dead. Now when he says that I am the God of those, they came well before what we know of the Moses story. And what we see from this is that we understand that God is reminding us in the scripture that he is the God of the living. And therefore, Jesus schools the Sadducees and he teaches them that there is a resurrection. And this is really important for us to see here. He reminds us also that, that when we get to heaven, things are different in heaven. Things aren't like they are here on earth. You know, we might think that we have things good here on earth, that we can take our best day when everything is, is going right and, and um, everything seems to be working for us. We can even think that it's a utopic situation for us. It pales in comparison, in total comparison of what life in heaven will really be like. So Jesus' answer reminds us that, that in his day, marriage was, was something of practical component. And, and what I mean by that is, is because the Jews believed at that particular time that a woman had no identity, that she was chattel, she was property, she didn't have a voice, uh, she was mainly uh, a companion to ultimately bear a male heir. And in Judaism, the identity of the family was tied specifically to the male. So therefore, a woman, when she is born into the world as a, as a little girl, as a child, her identity is her father's identity. When she marries, her identity is her husband's identity. And when she bears a male, male child, her identity now passes on into the male child. If we can go back into the Old Testament, we can see the story of Ruth or the book of Ruth. And we find out in that particular case that, that Ruth, um, her husband dies and they don't have a child. And Ruth then has no identity. And, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, takes her upon her wing and, and brings her into the family, so to speak. And from that, Boaz becomes the redeemer. And they have a child together as they come together. So Jesus' answer reminds us that, that in his day, that marriage uh, was a practical transaction. That unlike today, women don't have pensions. Unlike today, women don't have social security. Unlike today, women can't own businesses. Unlike today, they, women can't have their own investment accounts. Because in biblical times, they couldn't do that. And Jesus is saying in this particular place, to the Sadducees especially, he's saying in heaven, no one needs to be taken care of anymore. No one needs a man, specifically to their question, to take care of them. Why? Because their heavenly father will take care of them. Who does a woman belong to in heaven? Which of the seven husbands owns her? Jesus says in heaven things are different than they are on earth. In heaven women don't belong to men because in heaven we all belong to one, and that is God. We belong to God. God is the one who made us. God is the bridegroom, and, and, and we are his bride, and therefore we are of God. Now, let me, let me kind of make this a practical point. Let, let's just say that Patty and I had an arrangement, and, um, and that arrangement maybe, uh, let's say that arrangement went like this, that, that um, if Patty were to predecease me, if she were to die before me, let's say that our arrangement was that I, that I wouldn't remarry. 
Uh, let's say, though, that if I died before Patty, that our arrangement was that, that she could remarry or that she should remarry. And let's say that a point in time comes after my death that Patty decides and falls in love and decides to marry another man. This is exactly the question that the Sadducees are asking because now it becomes that whole eternal thing and, and what will happen and, and what will happen in that day that as I'm already in heaven and, and Patty comes to heaven and her believing husband comes to heaven, is there gonna be some cat fight up there as to you know uh, jockeying for position that she He's mine and not yours and all those kinds of things. Jesus is saying the rules are different in heaven. Let me tell you why. On earth, we get jealous, don't we? On earth, we live into our brokenness every day. On earth, we covet things. On earth, we compare. On earth, we want to be bigger, badder, and bolder than any competition that we can see. And therefore, on earth, when you see that there are new marriages through divorce or even when a spouse dies, the children don't like the fact that the remaining parent has remarried because they're fighting all these earthly emotions. And Jesus says it's different when we go to heaven. And he says this, and in that example that I'm giving, this is how I read what Jesus is saying. That if I die before Patty and in her life she remarries another man, and then she dies and he dies and we're all in heaven, what happens? Let me tell you what happens. I will have nothing but unconditional love for my wife. And let me tell you that the deeper sense of that is I will have nothing but unconditional love for her husband. Why? Because he loved my first love. And because he poured his heart out to her. And because he claimed her to love her, to honor her, to cherish her. And because of that, I will have nothing but love for him. And because he loves my love and, and because we share something in common, and that's what heaven is. Heaven says that we don't need the kinds of things that we have on earth, that those laws and things that bind us relationally are gone. Because in heaven, we have unconditional love for each other because God is our heavenly father. So Jesus was teaching a very important question, answer to a very important question. He was teaching about marriage. He was pointing us into the direction that we see the truth, that on earth we might need someone to complete us. In these particular times, biblically, a woman needed a man to complete her. But Jesus said, in heaven things are different. And I think that's pretty cool if you're single, if you've chosen never to marry, or, or if you're a widow or you're a widower, uh, what that says is if you die as a single person, when you get to heaven, all those awkward feelings that you had about being with your friends that were married and about being the third wheel and, and being you know, uh, uh, part of the crowd and not fitting in and all that, what it means is when you get to heaven, none of that matters. That all those people that you love but that you felt so awkward about because you were single, all that goes away. Because you don't need a man to complete you. You don't need a woman to complete you. God. You. I read not long ago a story of a, of a little girl that was um, in the shopping mall with her mother, and um, what can happen sometimes with children is they get detached from their parent. The parent's looking at something, and the child's holding the hand next thing you know, the child's gone. And it happened to us one time at a craft show many, many years ago with our oldest daughter when she was very young, and we found her, and, and, uh, and, and we related by that, so I really can relate to the story I'm going to tell you. So this little girl is at the shopping mall with her mother and they get separated and the little girl walks over and she's crying, tears coming down in her face and, and the, the, the clerk behind the counter comes out and says, little girl, little girl, you know, uh, what's your name? And she tells her her name and, and she says, um, who do you belong to? And, and uh, who's your mommy? And tell me your mommy's name. Who do you belong to? And the girl says her mother's name and she says, do you remember what your mommy's wearing today? And the little girl describes what her mom is wearing. And she said, remind me again, who do you belong to? And the little girl says her mother's name again. And the store manager gets on the on-call system, all-call system of the store. And he calls out the mother's name and he says, come by the cosmetics counter. We have a gift waiting for you here. And you can imagine the mother's heart is beating and throbbing and thumping and, and she goes running to the cosmetic center and there is her daughter and her daughter sees her and the mother sees her daughter and the little girl's arms are outstretched going, mommy, 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 I love you. And the mother swoops her up and grabs her and holds her and, and they're kind of playfully moving around saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. And why was it now complete for the little girl? Because she was with who she belonged to. 
And that's really my question this morning for us. On this Monday, on this day that we're talking about these questions about Jesus, do you know who you belong to? Do you know that you belong to a, to a God who loves you? A God who says, follow me. A God who says that even in your greatest life's challenges, even in your most explosive moments, the darkest feelings that you could ever have, he chooses and he always will be the light to shine you to a new way. His word says this, that I am with you always to the end of time, which says something. It reminds us of the truth of who we belong to. And the significant thing that, that we have here is, in knowing that, is that God does not abandon us. He doesn't forsake us. It doesn't matter our circumstances. But our Heavenly Father loves us so much that he promises to never let us go. And the truth is, when we know who we belong to, despite whatever is happening, he will never leave us. I want to close this morning with um, a time of prayer. And in our own heritage as United Methodists, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, had something that he called upon all of the Methodist Christians to do often, and it was called a prayer of covenant renewal. And I want to walk us through this prayer together, and I want to invite you to uh, look at the words on the screen, or if uh, you're here in the auditorium today, as you bow your head, just repeat the words after me and say them aloud as we pray this prayer. Lord, make me what you will. I put myself fully into your hand. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you. Let me be laid aside for you. Let me be full let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and with a willing heart give it all to your pleasure and disposal. Lord, as we pray this prayer together today, help us to renew that covenant within us, to know who we belong to, to know whose we are, and I pray today, not only for the people of St. Paul, United Methodist Church, but I pray for your people all throughout the world that daily we would covenant with you in a way of praying to re-identify and to claim who we are in you. In Jesus' name, amen.